This is Heartrepreneur Radio, maximizing your personal and business results by leading with your heart. With your host, Terry Levine. Listen every week as Terry tackles the topics that will help you become a successful heart centered entrepreneur. Be sure to read the blog posts at www.hearttrepreneur.com slash blog. Come back often and add this show to your favorite RSS feed or subscribe in iTunes. You can also follow Terry on Twitter at Mentor Terry and on Facebook.com slash Heartrepreneur Terry Levine. And now here's Terry. Welcome to Heartrepreneur Radio and TV show with Terry Levine. I'm your co-host, Velma Gallant, and I'm excited to be here today. You can connect with Terry, me, and other like-minded, heart-based business owners in the Heartrepreneurs with Terry Levine Facebook group. So go check it out. And we always love it when you like our shows and give us the five-star reviews. It lets us know that the content we're giving you is of value to you. So today's quote is, our job is to connect to people, to interact with them in a way that leaves them better than we found them, more able to get where they'd like to go, Seth Godin. So today's topic is an interesting one. And for those of you who are on the internet and are marketing online, it's going to be one you're going to love. We're going to be talking about email marketing today. Our special guest this week is Chase Diamond. He's a top email commerce, top e-commerce email marketer, and he sent close to 1 billion emails, resulting in 50 plus million dollars in email attributable revenue for his clients and himself. So welcome to the show, Chase. Thank you so much for having me. How are you? I am doing really well. Thank you. Uh, bundled up for a little bit of winter winter weather, but uh, I'm looking forward to what you've got to share today. I So I did a little bit of uh, internet sleuthing and looked up a little bit about you. And uh, you started in the marketing realm really quite young. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So for those that are unfamiliar with Crohn's or colitis, they're, they're grouped under what's called IBD, which is inflammatory bowel disease. So at the age of 13 years old, I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease and I was sick for about a year. And when I was reflecting on why I was sick for about a year, Really, the biggest reason was there was lack of awareness of this disease. There's about 1.3 million people in the U.S. that have, you know, Crohn's slash IBD. So I talked about myself as a 14-year-old that I didn't want anyone to be sick for a year just due to not knowing about it, right? That's a pretty terrible reason to be sick. Um, I kept getting misdiagnosis after misdiagnosis. So at 14 years old, um, myself, along with my parents, we kind of taught ourselves, you know, what we call guerrilla marketing, right? This was calling friends on the phone. This was taking out newspaper ads. This was building teams for these kind of annual walks that we would do. So from the ages of 14 to 16, you know, I was able to help affect, you know, thousands of people's lives and raise tens of thousands of dollars. And at 16 years old, I actually became the youngest board member of the Crohn's and Clytus Foundation. And I served a six-year board term there. So it was kind of through necessity that I, I kind of found marketing and found the love of it just because I saw how impactful it was. So from you know 16 to 22, while I was in high school and college, served a six-year board term on this foundation. Throughout college, I had to help pay for my own tuition. So I was working six, eight, 10 jobs, internships, really figuring out like, what I did not like versus what I liked. Uh, and that's kind of how I found a love of email. That is really cool. That's, a, that's an awesome story. I know um, the uh, Crohn's and IBS, there, it's, it's a one degree, two degrees. I guess I don't count myself as a degree. Do I count myself as a degree? <laughs> Anyways, know. you know, it impacts people that, that I know and love. And so I totally get that, um, what your experience was. And I love that you took it, turned it into something amazing. And you ended up benefiting um, yourself and your, you continue to benefit others with the knowledge that you built through that time. Absolutely. And I, I don't remember this, but my parents always tell me the thing that stuck out to them is I'm the oldest of four boys. So I have three younger brothers. And I guess I said to my parents at one point, I'm so glad it was me and not them. So I guess I've always kind of had this attitude of wanting to help others. And the mm -hmm. fact that we were able to find success in helping others and kind of really light up other people's days, it really made it easy and kind of almost addictive, for lack of a better word, to keep going, keep helping, keep giving, because the people we brought along on the way and the people that we impacted. So that was probably the coolest experience I've had. Um, and it's not one right that I made any money from. So it's kind of interesting today when we talk about 
some of the things that I do that are obviously for profit. A lot of this nonprofit stuff to me is even more special um, for all the reasons that people wouldn't expect. Well, I mean, wealth come, wealth shows up in many ways, right? Like it's not just a financial wealth. I mean, there's a whole lot of uh, heart wealth in, in what you accomplished during that time and probably continue to accomplish with that. Cool. So that, that is, that is totally cool. So, Lately, there's there's been a lot of interviews that I've done that have been along the, the lines of mindset. And when I first looked at what was coming up, I was excited about there being a lot of practical, but I have a feeling there's a lot of mindset in email marketing. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, with email in particular, I think it's a mindset's definitely a big thing. Um, it's kind of almost another thing that's like, you know, science versus kind of a, a gut feeling, right? And kind of you're something you're, you, you know, right? It's kind of this weird thing where it's been around for a really long time, yet people are kind of still figuring it out. Um, but the mindset, I think, plays a very important part in, in everything, right? In email and some of the things that we're all able to accomplish on the sidelines. Um, so I, I think at the end of the day, right, if you think that you could do something and you commit to something, I think that's really been kind of at the core of everything I've done, right? Is having that mindset that like, you know, I can make an impact and having that mindset that, you know, we're going to make something of ourselves and you just kind of channel in on it. And you're kind of crazy to see like three months down the line, six months down the line, a year down the line, what you're able to accomplish when you kind of go all in. Mm -hmm. So what would you say is the most important thing for somebody to consider as they're, they're setting up, they're getting ready to um, move into email marketing? Yeah. So with email, I think the most important thing to preface is like, there's no silver bullets, right? I think a lot of people ask me, what's that one thing I have to do to get this massive return, right? And the answer there is like, there's not one thing. There's a, there's a set of many things. So within email to kind of go a little bit into it, there's three different types of emails. One is a campaign. And a campaign basically is a one-time send to a group of contacts. Think about like a Black Friday sale or a Cyber Monday sale or a holiday sale or kind of a product launch, right? Those are kind of a, basically a campaign. The other side of the house is what we call a flow or an automation. And these are emails that will work around the clock for you um, when you're sleeping, right? So this is something like a welcome series for non-buyers. Someone will enter their email into a pop-up for a 10% off discount. We will send you a discount code via email. That's a welcome series for non-buyers. It's basically about educating and nurturing you. There's also those abandoned cart emails, right? You've left something in your cart. You get an email reminder if you've not purchased it to, to rebuy. And then the last type of email is what's called a transactional email. And it's basically like an order or a shipping confirmation. Hey, Chase, just want to let you know your order for product X, Y, and Z has shipped. That's, so those basically are the three different types of emails. And you have to give each of them love and attention because they're so important for each step of the customer journey to either convert someone into a buyer or once someone bought to really make them feel warm and fuzzy and reduce buyer's remorse. So those are kind of the, step, the steps within email that you have to execute. Okay. I like that. I like that. Um, Cause yeah, I agree. We all seem to want the silver bullet for just about everything. <laughs> Doesn't matter what we're touching. It's like, what's, what's the, what's the thing that's going to get me the most impact. And I think too, that's where the mindset comes in is, is shifting the mindset from necessarily what, it, what, I mean, you want to track it. You do want to get to your sales and stuff like that. Like that's a given. But I think that when we shift our focus away from that to what do I have to offer? How can I offer the best? How can I make the most impact? Um, how can how can I really contribute to who it, whoever it is that's on the other side of that email? That kind of shifts it. Yeah, one of the things you just mentioned to me, I think it's my favorite part about email. And it's the fact that you can, be, it's, it's obviously one to many, right? We're sending an email to 100 people, 1,000 people, 100,000 people, even some of our clients have, you know, millions of people on their list. Um, and the really cool part about email is if I can get you to open the email, right? And that's done through where you land. Are you in my inbox? Are you in my promotions? Are you in my spam? It's done by the subject line, right? Is the subject line something relative? Is the from name, you know, Chase Diamond or, you know, Heartrepreneur, whatever it might be, is it familiar? Is it relevant? And is the preview text something that, you know, plays along with the subject line to get people to open it? And if I can get people to open the email, I have their attention for two seconds, 10 seconds, 30 seconds, a minute. It's really up to me on how long I could captivate the audience. And what I really like about email is the fact that while it is one to many, 
it's really an intimate and personal feeling because it's just me and you in the inbox, right? Like when you're on social media, there's an ad from your mom, there's a, a post from your husband, there's a something else from someone else, right? Mm -hmm. There's all these distractions on your screen. But typically within an email, it's just the email from me that you're reading. So it's a really kind of a fun psychological mindset. It's almost like a game of sorts, right? Like, can we get people to open the email, obviously in a way that's not clickbait or not spam? And can we captivate their attention? Can we tell them a story? Can we make them feel a certain type of way? Can we get them to purchase it, right? So that's really the cool part about email is it allows your brand to really share itself and kind of what it values and kind of to give back and help in a really unique and different way than people are used to. And I think what you're, what, what I'm hearing is it, it actually speaks to how important it really is to make sure that the people you're speaking to, you know exactly how to connect to them. But Terry always says, you know, stay in your lane, narrow focus. And I think what I'm hearing is, is that's vitally important when it comes to your emails too, because otherwise, how do you create that intimacy with that person in the email if you cannot speak to them directly, if you have to keep it general? It, exactly. And there's a lot of really cool things that we do from being pretty basic to pretty advanced to make sure that we are delivering the right message. So for example, in some of the email tools that we do use, you're able to sort from by gender, right? And again, it's not a perfect science, but it's pretty close. We're nine out of 10 times. I'm going to be speaking to a woman if it says that she's a female, right? Um, or I'm going to be speaking to a male if it says that he's a, you know, a male. Um, so by segmenting by gender, right, I can serve content that men and women we think they're going to want. And we kind of have a fallback at the very bottom in case we got it wrong or in case they're shopping for a significant other. Um, mm -hmm. So that's one way, right, that we try to be relevant within the email. Um, another, right, is based off of geography. And that's not one that people think about a lot within email. I'm over here on the West Coast. Are you on the East Coast? Where are you based? I'm in the prairies, so I'm mountain time. So I'm kind of in the middle. <laughs> okay. So, so from, you know, West through the middle through the East, Speaking to someone, depending on like what season is, right? So if it's, let's say in the fall, someone on the West Coast, you know, might still be wearing like flip-flops and sandals and t-shirts, right? So you're going to want to serve them a little bit different content within an email if you're an apparel company than you would that someone that's on the East Coast where it's pretty freezing, right? You'd want to serve them hoodies, you know, sweatpants, jackets, right? So that's another really interesting way that you can serve content based off where people are, depending on what you sell, Right. If you sell obviously jewelry or, you know, cologne or makeup, it doesn't necessarily matter. But if you're an apparel company or someone that has a different product, maybe you're even like a supplements company that sells products for joints versus this versus the other. And depending on the weather, it might mean this or that. So there's some really cool stuff that you could do. The other things that you can obviously do or track what people are clicking on, right? At the end of the day, that's going to be the truth um, for you, right? What are people clicking on? Sure, they're a male or sure they're a female or sure they're based on California or New York, but what are they clicking on? What do they actually care about? What blog posts are they reading? So really long-winded, the ability to segment your audience is crucial for delivering you know, high value experiences and ultimately having them want to engage in your community and hopefully purchase from your brand. Wow, I didn't know that you could get that detailed with email marketing. That's, Crazy. that's pretty amazing. That is really amazing. Um, so, so this is some of the, the, the software or applications that you have available that support your clients with that kind of thing. Is that what you teach in any of your programs? Yeah, it, exactly. So um, within a couple of the softwares, you know, I use one called Clavio. It's an e-commerce driven platform. There's a lot of the other ones like MailChimp and Bronto and active campaign, right? There's a whole suite of them. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, everyone asks me like, what platform do I need to be on? And I'm, I think I'm a little bit biased because I have a great experience with Clavio, but I think the platform that you pick is really determined by the platform that you have experience in, right? If you have experience with MailChimp or active campaign, you know, don't go to Clavio just because, you know, you heard some guy on a radio station saying, go to this platform, right? So I think that's really important to pick the platform that you are familiar with versus someone that tells you to do something. Um, and yeah, these softwares, right? Like at the end of the day, they are software. So they all are more or less comparable. And it's the person that's pulling the strings and kind of inputting the things into the software that has to have the expertise. But in some of the courses I have and with the clients, like that expertise lives on our side. 
Right, right. Well, and and I think so each of the software, there's going to be similar things in each of them. So you kind of, if you know what you're looking for, you should be able to find it. Um, And comfort level with with operating it. I think a lot of people, um, depending on on what they're in, they're going to have a team that's going to be developing or working on some of these things as well. So um, what I want to make sure is that our listeners actually know how to find you and how to get access to some of these things that you offer. What is the best way for our listeners to be able to connect with you? Yeah, so uh, my website's uh, Chase Diamond. There's no A in Diamond, so it's just D-I-M-O-N-D. So Chase Diamond with that Um On there, I have a bunch of resources on you know how I grew a newsletter from zero to half a million subscribers in 10 months. I go through a guide. So tons of great free content on my website. So you guys can check it out there. And if anyone has any question, I believe there's a contact form. I'd be happy to clarify anything I've mentioned here or any other questions that you guys have about email. Perfect. And and all your social media and everything like that is is on there as well? Yeah, it should be. The, the place I contribute most content to is Twitter. And my handle is just ecom, E-C-O-M, uh, Chase Diamond. Again, no A in Diamond. I know it's kind of confusing. Okay, that is really good to know because we want to know where you play the most so that we can actually get the benefit from it. So that's that's awesome. So, okay. So you talked about growing a list. And I know a lot of people, um, that's something that, that they think about. I mean, it's, it's something that I think about. If you were to offer a couple of tips on um, is it, is it the software that's more important for growing your list? Is it where you're going to grow your list? Is it what you're offering to grow your list? What would you say is, is the top thing to be paying attention to? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, if I had to rank those, I think one would be like where you're getting your traffic from, like what's the quality of the traffic, right? Is the quality high and is it relevant, right? If you, Let's say, for example, in the past, I built a travel series, right? So are these people travelers? Are they interested in travel or have they never traveled, nor do they never want to travel, right? Travel to all those kind of broad and people, whether they travel or don't, they kind of have this inspiration and, and kind of this, you know, love for it. It's kind of this mm-hmm. thing I feel like it's ingrained in all of us. But so like with the travel series that I built, um, one, one way was, you know, a lot of paid ads, right? So you run paid ads, right? Through this landing page and paid ads, you know, you, Facebook, Instagram, Google, Pinterest, Snapchat, it really is depending on, again, like who your audience is. You know, if you're, if you're skewing a little bit older, maybe you want to be on Facebook, right? If you're skewing in the middle, maybe you want to be running traffic on Instagram. If you're skewing younger, maybe you want to be on Snapchat, right? Like, again, there's obviously different nuances to, to each platform, um, but one is, is the traffic source. Um, and other traffic sources are things like SEO, right? Maybe you're really great at driving traffic organically through Google or Yahoo, et cetera. Um, Or maybe you have influencers or celebrities or affiliates in your network that are going to push traffic to your your page. Um, So that's one. And then two, when they're on your page, it it is the combination of what you mentioned in terms of, do you have the right tool set up to capture emails? And is the offer or is the value proposition, you know, something that you can get behind? So, you know, do you have an embedded email form? Do you have something that pops up? Do you have something that flies out? Is there a way and a mechanism for you to collect emails? And what is it that you're promising them? You know, enter your email to get 10% off our, our e-commerce store or enter your email to get a weekly free newsletter on the best places to travel or, you know, enter your email to get our top 10 uh, recipes of 2020, 2021, you know, 2022 doesn't, doesn't matter the year, right? Um, so all those different things are really important. I'd say within e-commerce, in terms of collecting emails on decent traffic, most people are probably collecting about two to four percent, maybe three to five percent of the people that actually visit their website, and they're converting that traffic into emails. With a lot of the clients that we're working with, we're constantly testing. So basically, for every hundred people, they're collecting two to four or three to five people. For a lot of the stuff that we do, you know, we've really figured out like how to get more people to opt in in a, in a way that doesn't deteriorate the quality. So we're averaging maybe six to eight, maybe eight to ten people out of every hundred people which is about a two to three X of what they're, they're doing. And the way that we're able to do that, again, is ensuring that there's quality traffic, ensuring that the offer is one that's you know, valid and one that's attractive, 
And then three is the mechanism of collecting emails. There's a lot of different things. So people will show a pop-up right when you land on the page. That typically, showing it immediately, is too early. People don't have enough context. They haven't had time to play around your website. They're not going to want to give you your email that quickly. Mm -hmm. However, if you wait like six or 10 seconds, after people have at least had a chance to see who you are and kind of what you're about briefly, that will increase, and again, not in all, but in most cases, that will increase your conversion because people have had a little bit more trust. The other way that we do it sometimes is we test showing it to you upon exit intent. So essentially that means you're on my website and you're kind of moving your mouse to the exit screen. And this will pop up before you do and says, hey, wait, before you go, enter your email for 15% off, right? Like it might be a different offer it might be the same offer. There's all these things that you have to really test because there's not one size fits all. Well, I would, I would imagine too that some of the things like the type of audience would impact that yeah. as well, right? Like I know for myself when I go to a website and that pop-up comes up immediately, I do. I, I click it off because I haven't even had a chance to look at what I think I want to look at. And I think too, if somebody comes to your website and disappears within the first five seconds, they're not your target market anyways. And yeah. so you really don't care about them. So that's, that's super interesting because what I'm, what I'm hearing is, is when you make that available is, is really quite strategic and dependent upon who it is that you're, you're trying to connect with. Yeah, exactly. And, and we're running what we call an AB test. And for those that are unfamiliar, an A-B test basically is just testing version A versus version B. And it's really important that when you run these tests, you're only focusing on, on one variable. So for example, if you're running a pop-up and you want to test the time delay, the pop-up will be the exact same in terms of the look and the feel. You'll have the exact same image. You'll have the exact same offer. You'll have the exact same button color. Everything will be similar. The only difference will be whether it shows immediately versus six seconds, right? So for person A, they'll get it immediately. And person B they'll get it in six seconds, right? So 50% of the traffic will receive one version, 50% of the traffic will receive the other. And this way we could see based off data. And again, you want this to be statistically significant. So you want there to hopefully be at least a thousand people or more that get to interact with each version. Obviously, the more, the better. For some people, you know, getting a thousand impressions on each of these pop-ups might take longer than another. With some of our clients, we literally could run a test within you know, a couple hours, they get that many people to their website every single day. Other clients, you know, it could take them a week all the way up to a month to figure out which one moves the needle. But it's really important with, you know, the pop-ups, with the subject lines, with all these different things. Again, only doing one variable at a time that you test these things because depending on the size of your list, a really small increase actually leads to a really big increase overall. If you could increase you know, one versus the other, even by like 10%, which doesn't sound huge. Think about if you have 10,000 people, 100,000 people, a million people, that 10% increase is probably the difference in between hundreds, if not thousands of dollars overall. That, that makes a lot of sense. And I think too, um, so, so what, I, what I'm hearing is, is if I, when it comes to the time to be doing some testing, if I had five or six different ideas that I wanted to test, I could pick, you know, like say I had six, I could group them off two, 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 and then maybe test the best of the rest, best of those ones and find out what, what actually makes an impact. That's kind of cool. Yeah, exactly. So what I'd recommend to you is to say the six tests are like a, a pop-up, a subject line, um, you know, from name, an email offer, a call to action button color, right? Like whatever they all are you'd want to go one at a time because you'd, mm -hmm. you want to isolate the one that you're testing, right? Because yeah. if you test all six at once, and again, you, you mentioned that if you test all six at once, obviously what, you wouldn't know like which one moved the needle. So yeah, exactly like you said, you, you kind of go in the stages or the buckets of going one or two at a time, like you know, an A versus B at a time, and then to the next one, then to the next one. So that way you can kind of take the learnings from each one, apply them. And ultimately at the end, right, your email is going to be way better off or your pop-up is going to be way better off this goes for everything, your website, right? Your ad, mm -hmm. this really is applicable to almost all the marketing discipline. Well, I, I was, you know, I was thinking that, I mean, it even applies outside of it. I mean, I was thinking nutrition, like you add, you add a new supplement to it. You add five supplements. You don't know which one made the difference exactly. for you. <laughs> exactly. So, 
That makes that makes a lot of sense. So So we've talked a bit about um, testing. We've talked a bit about um, going after the right kind of traffic. Uh, we've talked a bit about being able to segment your list. Is there anything else that you think is really important to let our listeners know about right now? Yeah, I think the last thing that I'll end on, and, and this part kind of like trips people up and I get why. So for, for example, um, everyone, say you have a hundred people on your list. Let's keep the math really easy. If a hundred people on your list, everyone intuitively thinks if I email all 100 people, irrespective of whether they're engaged or not, that that's going to be better for me. If I send it to a hundred people versus sending it to the 80 people that are actually engaged, so these hundred people is a mixture of people that have purchased, people that have not purchased, people that have opened emails, people that have never opened emails, right? Everyone thinks by sending to that segment that they're going to be better off than sending to the 80 people that have purchased or opened recently. And it's this really counterintuitive thing that actually sending to the 80 people is gonna be better for you, not only in the short term, but specifically in the midterm and long term. So the way that Google and Yahoo, they're called ISPs, they're called internet service providers, all the people that own the inboxes, Gmail obviously is the most prevalent. The way that these wor- used to work, when I first started an email five, six years ago, they used to reward people that just sent tons of emails. The more emails you send, the better you're going to be. The more people you hit, the better you're going to be. Today, everything is about the quality of the emails you're sending. Are you sending to the people that want to hear from you? Are you sending to the people that are opening your emails? Are you sending to the people that are clicking your emails? Are you sending to the people that are purchasing from you versus just sending to everyone? The way that you end up in spam is by batching and blasting every single person on your list, irrespective of their engagement. So over time, Google and Yahoo and all these places, they're looking at how people interact with your email. If someone opens it, if someone clicks it, if someone forwards it, those are all what we call positive interactions. However, if someone does not open it, if someone marks as spam, if someone bounces, if someone unsubscribes, those are all negative reinforcements to Google and that will ding you. So the way that Google knows whether your emails are good or bad is how people respond, right? That's the only Mm -hmm. way that they can know whether you're sending spam or not, right? And like we consider spam anything to be unrelevant, right? It doesn't have to be the spammy things that you're used to thinking, but receiving emails that you're not opening, you don't want to receive is a form of spam in Google's eyes. Um, so long-winded, what I'm basically saying is the importance of sending to the people that want to hear from you is really crucial for maintaining high open rates and what we call high deliverability. And deliverability basically is a fancy word for saying the ability to get your emails delivered to the inbox or the promotions and not the spam. Because if you're in the spam, you know, your open rates might be 2%, 5%, maybe a max of 10%. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you're in the promotions or the inbox, you should be 10, 15, 20 and, and, and higher, right? So that's right. exactly why we hit the people that are open opening. And the benchmark that we use is trying to hit a 20% or higher open rate on a campaign. That's how you pick the right list size. For some people, that's a 30 day engage. And that's basically people that have opened or clicked or purchased in the last 30 days. For other people, that's all the way up to a 120 day engage, maybe even a 150 day engage. People have opened your email in the last four or five months. They've clicked, they've done these things. So you have to pick the segment that allows you to really straddle the line of hitting a 20% open rate as the benchmark. Again, not every single email has to be a 20%. Some can be a 16, some can be a 25, right? But getting as close to 20% or higher is better. So do you think it's important for people to kind of like clean out the people who aren't opening or like, is, do you have like six months? If they haven't opened anything in the last six months, we just shuffle them out? Yeah, it's, it's super important for, for two, two reasons. One is you pay typically your email provider on a per contact basis. So if you have all these contacts that are not opening emails, you're actually paying more money to house them when they're not doing any, any value for you, they're actually doing harm. And the second was to the reason I mentioned the fact that, you know, sending to them actually hurts your list over time. So by cleaning them out and, and the way that we pick the time frame is dependent on how frequently you send. If you send every single day, you'll probably want to shorten that window to let's say like 45 or 60 days because you've given these people, you know, 45 to 60 times to open your emails. If they have not opened that many emails. They're never going to probably open. Um, however, if you send a few times a week or a few times a month, you know, expanding out to like a 90 day or a 120 day and get, you know, it's probably okay. Okay. That's really interesting. Well, we've actually 
already used up our time. This went really very fast. Um, I've really valued the the insight that you shared regarding email marketing. There's a whole lot more to it than just opening up an autoresponder. Yes. Um, so again, what's the website people should go to? Um, Chase Diamond. So it's D-I-M-O-N-D dot com or um, find me on Twitter at E-C-O-M, which is Ecom Chase Diamond. Thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. I can't believe it's already over. I know it went it went really quickly, and uh, and I love the information you shared, and I sure are I'm sure our listeners got a huge amount of value from uh, from this content that we that we brought up through the conversation. So, if you've really enjoyed the information that uh, Chase has shared with you, be sure to hit the like button, give us a five star review, and make sure you go to Facebook and find Heartrepreneurs with Terry Terry Levine and join us there. We look forward to seeing you at their next show. You've been listening to Heartrepreneur Radio, maximizing your personal and business results by leading with your heart with your host Terry Levine. This show is produced every week for your enjoyment and education. To make sure you never miss a single show, add us to your favorite RSS feed or subscribe in iTunes. You can also read Terry's latest blog posts at www.heartrepreneur.com slash blog. Or follow Terry on Twitter at Mentor Terry and on Facebook.com slash Heartrepreneur Terry Levine. Your questions and comments are always welcome and appreciated. Send them to Terry on either Facebook or Twitter. Thank you for listening.